today's webinar is Molecular and Physiological Mechanisms of Drought Tolerance in Rice, A Tale of Backbencher Gene by Dr. Dhananjay Gotarkar. He is from Erie, Philippines. Dr. Gotarkar is a, a passionate agricultural scientist with a so, strong interest in contributing to global missions in food security and zero hunger, which come from his scientific knowledge and hands-on experience in the field of agriculture, plant breeding, plant physiology, plant molecular biology, and biotechnology. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture, uh, Agriculture Biotechnology, followed by his Master's of Science in Plant Biotechnology from University of Agricultural Sciences, GKVK Bengaluru, with scholarship from Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Dr. Gotarkar then decided to join the International Rice Research Institute, that is ERI, in Philippines, for his PhD in Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, for which he earned a prestigious National Overseas Scholarship from the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. During his PhD at ERI and the University of Philippines, he attended several international conferences and symposiums and gave lectures at different meetings and scientific occasions. He has won the Young Scientist Award 2016 and the Best Poster Award 2017 for his PhD research work. He then joined the Institute of Plant and Microbial Biology, Academia Sinica, Taiwan, for his postdoctoral research for the year 2019 and 2020. Currently, he works as a research consultant for ERI, India, office in Varanasi. We are very happy that he has accepted our request to present his work on our platform. I now request Dr. Dhananjay Kotarko to please uh, present and uh, share his screen. Thanks. Thank you, Shoma, for the kind introduction. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for inviting me for this um, presentation for this webinar. Okay. Without any delay, let's start. All right. So as the title suggests, it's a molecular and physiological mechanisms for drought tolerance in rice, but most of you must be wondering why it's a tail of backbencher Z. So I want to clear that up in the beginning. Why I call it a backbencher? You might know, you might have seen or noticed in your class there are that one student who always like to sit at the back bench in the class. But then nobody notice him or nobody pay attention to him because he sits in the back bench. Maybe he's not talented or smart, but when the final exam results come, he is the topper. So that's the similar situation with this gene that the breeders and farmers have not looked at this gene or have not selected the variety looking at these genes. But when they selected the good varieties, this gene came along and this is the gene which is giving or uh, contributing to the drought tolerance and yield. The data and the results, why I call it backbencher, you will see in the presentation. Okay, so I'll give a very little brief introduction about drought. Then I'll talk about a QTO, which is QDTI 12.1 and its effect in drought tolerance and yield. Um, I'll show you the major candidate genes from the QTL and among those candidate genes, talk of one which is called amidohydrolase, and we will go into the detail of its functional characterization, its involvement in the physiological trait and epigenetics. <clears throat> um, as we know that rice is a staple food for more than 60% of the world's population, and more than 90% of world's rice is grown and consumed in Asia. The major constraint uh, to the rice yield is drought, which, is, which comes under the biotic stresses. And that too, the reproductive stage drought involves major yield losses. So being a molecular biology and biotechnologist, how you can contribute to bring the solution for this reproductive stage drought? Uh, I would say we can understand the molecular mechanisms, apply them in breeding and physiology, that's, what, where, that's where we can contribute as a molecular biologist. So here, um, the, the QDTAY 12.1 is a large effect QTL, which was identified by breeders uh, in Erie in 2007 on rice chromosome 12. 
for yield under drought at reproductive stage by crossing a Vandana a rice variety called Vandana, which is drought tolerant, and Vyrarium, uh, which is high yielding. So basically, Vyrarium QQL was introgressed into the Vandana background, and then they have tested it, uh, this QTL in multiple genotypes, multiple ecosystems, multiple climatic and uh, different things. What I want to stress on this slide is, breeders have seen that uh, this QTL from Vyrarum, when it introduces into the Vandana background, it gives a um, large increase in the yield at reproductive stage drought. But when they did the same, like introducing this QTL in different backgrounds from the different varieties, they don't see that. That means that these Vyrarium genes in this QTL, they need the support from the Vandana background to be more productive and more drought tolerant. And uh, this is Vandana and this is 481B. 481B is a near isogenic line generated from this Vandana and Vyrarium cross. Uh, what we see in 481B is uh, there is increased uh, root um, panicle branching. That means there is more grains, that means more yield, and increased lateral root and root branching uh, in the near isogenic line, which we don't see in Vandana. Even though Vandana is drought tolerant, we see more compared to the Vandana in 481B. That means that influence of that Vyrarum QTL on the Vandana is more um, beneficial for the plants. Okay. And then these are at least 10 candidate genes we identified from that QTL in our group. Um, and then one of them is no pickle meristem, which is a transcription factor. And we uh, hypothesize, hypothesize that this transcription factor could you know, control the other genes. Today we'll talk about this one amid hydrolate gene uh, throughout the presentation. So let's get started with its characterization. So the first thing we did for this gene when we came to know oh, this gene is good, we looked at the sequence homology and what we found out that it is uh, highly similar with S adenosyl homocysteine, uh, D aminase. So that means if you look at these reactions, can you see my cursor, Shoma? Okay. Yes. So if you um, SAH in this reaction, if SAH get deaminated, it will produce S inosyl homocysteine. And if our prediction is right, our omidahydrolase should do that. Mm -hmm. To know that, we clone this amido hydrolase gene from Vyrarum and Vandana, those are the two parents. Um, we clone into the topocloning vector. The size of this CDS of this gene is like around 1,400 base pairs. Then we subclone into the expression vector with a GST tag. Then we uh, induce this recombinant protein um, using the one millimolar IPTG and then uh, purified using the FTLC. The purification was done using the glutathione affinity matrix. So how does this work? That this is our amido hydrolase protein, which is tagged with uh, GST. So the glutathione matrix will bind this GST onto the matrix. And that's where our protein is tagged. Then we have binded our protein, then we will wash the contaminating protein, these black circles, we'll wash them out. And then we need to release our protein uh, into the fraction. So that's we call elution. So we elute our GST tag protein using the reduced uh, glutathione. Then we did the quality check of our different fractions. And here you can see a single very clear band at the 82 kilo delta, which is our GST tag uh, protein. Okay. So we have the protein now, the recombinant pure protein from the viral Vandana. Our earlier hypothesis or sequence similarity shows that it is similar to S adenosyl homocysteine deaminase. So our first try is to look at if our protein deaminates the SAH. So first we 
uh, used like around 500 nanogram of this recombinant protein, kept it with the substrate for like different trials, right? Three hours, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours overnight in the dark. But then we did not see any activity for S adenosyl uh, homocysteine. So that means it's not ASAH deaminase. Then we had tried with other nine substrates. Among them, we say we see a little activity with 2-deoxy adenosine, but a very significant activity with guanine. So we did that with Wireram, and then we also did the same with Vandana recombinant protein. So these are the HPLC peak. Um, you can see this is the guanine peak. These are the control peaks, and this is xanthine. So if guanine is deaminated, the product will be xanthine. Okay. So the viral recombinant protein shows that when we incubate it with guanine and run the uh, the reaction, we see that the guanine peak has been reduced reduced significantly, and the xanthine peak has increased. That means the viralium Wirarium recombinant protein had deaminated guanine to produce the xanthine, but we do not see that in Vandana. That means Vandana recombinant protein is unable to deaminate the guanine. So earlier uh, scientists have shown that the biochemical assays of guanine deaminase in coffee and tea leaf extracts, but the actual GDA gene, GDA is guanine deaminase. So get used to it. Till now, I called it amidrohydrolase, but after the activity, we know that it's a guanine deaminase. Next, throughout the presentation, I'll call it guanine deaminase. So the actual gene in plants was unknown. And then here we report the first guanine deaminase gene in rice. Okay, so we know the function of this gene, but we don't know why YRM is more active than one than one. To look at that, we uh, the variation between the one and nine YRM protein sequence, and we see their very valuable amino acid, amino acid uh, changes between one YRM and one and nine. To study into more detail, we did the protein stability analysis um, by molecular dynamic simulation, and what we see that there is more uh, percent of uh, helix helixes and number of hydrogen bonds in YRM compared to the Vandana. That means uh, the YRM GDA uh, seems to be more stable than Vandana. Then we also looked at the structure of these two proteins, prediction-based structure, structures, and we see that um, YRM has two extra helices. And that could be the reason that this protein is more stable and hence more active. On the simultaneous experiment, we also looked at the 3,000 rice accessions for the uh, nucleotide sequence differences that uh, we have looked at the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism for this gene in 3,000 accessions. And what we see, there is variable variations between the cultivated land races and the, the adapted varieties. Then we also looked at the protein sequence of this 3,000 accessions. And what we see that uh, the protein stability analysis uh, based on the Gibbs free energy, we generated this um, uh, phylogeny, protein phylogeny tree. Uh, this has been divided into three clades. The first clade is the more stable protein clade. That's where the YRM comes. The less stable protein clade. And then the unstable protein clade. That's where the Vandana comes. The interesting thing about this third clade is that most of the famous rice varieties which have been selected for drought tolerance or increased yield comes under this clade three. So what does that mean? Breeders and farmers have selected the null allele or unstable allele of this gene, uh, one in deaminase, throughout their evolution. And hence, I called it a backbencher gene. Um, so that was the functional characterization uh, of this gene. And then let's look at how it affects the epigenetics by modulating the GNA methylation. Um, to study this, we used a knockout line of this gene from uh, Taiwan uh, Rice Insertion Mutant Database. Uh, 
the tDNA was inserted in the seventh intron of this gene. Uh, we tested the qPCR, we did the gene expression analysis and all to see that this gene doesn't express uh, in the knockout, okay? Next, from this slide, I will call this knockout as delta O is GDO1. So our hypothesis for the epigenetic link is that, so we have the knockout, that means, so you can see here the reaction nine, our gene is guanine in deaminase. If we have the knockout, that means the guanine will not be converted into the xanthine. Xanthine is required in the plant to produce the further downstream uh, metaboloids called allantoin and urates and all, which is known to be contributing in the abiotic stress colors. Okay, so, and in plants, or plants, production of xanthine, the most preferable and economic pathway is making the xanthine from guanosine to guanine to xanthine. But if you block this pathway here, plants most preferable pathway is not working, then plant will shift to the another pathway, the alternate pathway, which is from xanthosine to xanthine, or this guanosine will convert into xanthosine and then xanthine. To, to make both guanosine or xanthosine, uh, the plant will need to pull this SAH to adenosine, to IMP, XMP, and xanthosine. So basically, there is a forward, forward pool of SAH and adenosine to make the xanthosine or either guanosine. And in that case, the SAH content will be reduced in the knockout, okay? So, and we know from the literature that SAH is a potent inhibitor of DNA methyl transferase. So let's get to this first, why potent inhibitor? So if there is enough SAH in the plant, it will inhibit the activity of DNA methyl transferase. If it inhibits the activity, that means the DNA methyl transferases will not be able to transfer the methyl group to the, or make, uh, get the cytosines methylated. And that's when the gene expression will happen. And that is the case in our hypothesis for the wild type. But in knockout, if we say this is knockout and SAH being pulled uh, in the forward direction to make the xanthosine and xanthine, that means the SAH content will be reduced. In that case, the, there will be release of inhibition of DNA methyl transferase. If there is a release, that means DNA methyl transferase are active and it will methylate the cytosines and hence gene silencing. So let's see if our hypothesis comes true using the knockout and the wild type. To, to study this, we opted uh, three different approaches. The first one was methyl sensitive amplification polymorphism, uh, where we used two uh, uh, scissors or restriction enzymes, MSP1 and HPA2, which, which cuts at different locations at the internal and external cytosines. Um, we did that and then calculated, analyzed the results. And what we see that there is increased DNA methylated sites in the knockout, the blue color, compared to the wild type. The another approach we used was ELISA-based global DNA, DNA, genomic DNA methylation quantification, where they used the anti uh, 5 methylated cytosine antibody to check the um, uh, methylated uh, DNA compared to the uh, control uh, methylated DNA. Okay. So there also we see that there is increased uh, percent methylated DNA uh, in the leaf come, uh, in the knockout compared to the wild type. The third approach we used was HPLC based DNA methylation quantification, where we quantified the, the cytosines and methylated, five prime methylated cytosines. And we see that uh, percent methylated cytosines were more again in knockout. So these three combined approaches shows us that the DNA methylation is increased in our knockout where the gone in deaminase is uh, blocked or knocked out. So I have, our hypothesis is correct in this case. Okay, let's get to the physiological aspect uh, or the drought tolerance, how it uh, helps 